Hello, everyone, and welcome to PAEA's March webinar, How to Involve Your Students in the Community as Artists. Tonight, we will hear from PAEA's 2020 Outstanding Secondary Non-Public Art, Art Educator, Erin Tiedemann, about the strategies that she uses to make a successful, all-encompassing art program, and how her students take initiative and design projects that serve their community. Registered participants will receive a Google Form link via email after the event to fill out for their one hour of Act 48 credit. This webinar will be recorded and available at a later date on the PAEA website. Before we begin the webinar, we are asking participants to mute your microphones during the presentation, but you may keep your video on um, during the presentation if you so choose. Those controls are located in the bottom left corner of the controls bar. We're leaving it up to you to decide on your level of privacy as the recording will be housed on the PAEA website. We are also asking everyone to sign in the chat roll please use the same name in which you registered for this event. The chat roll can be found along the bottom in the controls bar as well. Signing in will ensure that you receive the Act 48 link. You may also use the chat roll for questions during the presentation, and there will be a Q&A period after the presentation as well. Let's get this webinar rolling. Erin, take it away. Okay, so I want to thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, I think that I wouldn't have been able to uh, establish such an exciting program had it not been for communicating and networking with other teachers. So I'm happy to pass any knowledge that I can even begin to give anybody on. So how do we involve your students in the community as artists? And I don't think it's as simple as I can just give you a formula and you can just execute it. So I tried to like come up with these steps because I think it's like nice to see like you, you have to start here and you have to build this program. So, so where do you start? So I think it's really important. These five things for me was um, how I was able to come into a school district that didn't have a very strong art program and develop it to where we're at today. Now, I think what's interesting about my school personally is it's a small school. So this is feasible for really anyone. So if you have a very large school, this um, can be executed with like a team. And then if you have a small school like I do, um, it's still, you're still able to do this. So I think it's really important to start out with this open scope and sequence for your program. I think you have to build internally first before you can even begin to like go externally from the school community. So I think it's also important to make art the same caliber as the rest of the programs in the school because students will take it more seriously. Um, they'll give you a lot more energy and enthusiasm if they think that it's of the same academic level as um, you know your other programs. And then I think that you have to start internally and you have to build your, your leaders inside. There's so many things I wanna do, but I just kind of make a list and I try to tackle one or two things a year. I try to do the one or two things really well before I even attempt to move on to something else. Um, because some, what I've learned is like when I take too many things on, like nothing's ever done really well. <laughs> and I'd rather be um, really good for my students and for myself so I don't fall flat on my face. So developing a scope and sequence, um, I like I got thrown into this curriculum writing role when I first started teaching and you know people go to school for that. So I was really um, intimidated when they asked me to like write this curriculum. So a good friend of mine and a mentor suggested that I try to, to make this scope and sequence and I wanted to like set a path for the students and not just an art curriculum path, but like an art lover path. So not all of your students are going to be artists when they you know, go on to college, they're going to be engineers and they're gonna to go to trade schools. But the one thing I think is important is to you know, instill in them that they should be an active participant in their community. And being an active participant means supporting their arts programs because they think you know, cult, your communities flourish when you have strong arts. And if you look at history, um, it, it shows us that, it demonstrates that. So why I think this is important. I, I think it helps keep us on task and it helps keep students on task when they know that there's like these building blocks that they have to go through. Um, it does allow for enrichment. So when you have these specific paths, this scope and sequence, it allows you to work with other teachers from different departments 
and, and you can set like real goals. Um, so I think that's another reason why it's really important. And I, just for myself personally, and like I said, I, I have a, we have a small school. There's about 400 students at the high school. So I developed three paths. Um, and like I said, I didn't really know what I was doing when I did this. So I just read a lot. But these are the three paths that I developed at the high school. So I have technical arts, advanced arts, and then survey arts. And the survey arts are more for our students who, you know, it, it's a requirement to take two credits of arts and most art classes at our school is one um, half a, or one semester. So they need four classes total if they're taking semester courses. So we tried to align these, these survey classes. So, you know, kids could take classes that were fun, but they were still to be taken seriously because one of my biggest pet peeves is when uh, kids assume that art is like a dumping ground. And I don't really appreciate it when administrators think that as well. So I think that when you, you, you know, approach your, your curriculum this way, like the administrators take you more seriously and they know like, hey, you can't just dump kids in these classes. So this is what we have. We do have a technical arts program. Uh, we do have graphic design and digital photography and printmaking and creative design. Uh, and then the advanced art, we have the AP, well, what's called art and design now, um, painting, drawing, ceramics one and two. And um, you could, and you see how I've like overlapped some of these classes. So some could take all of them, especially kids that are very serious about taking the arts. And I think what's um, really exciting about our program when I first came in, it was just art one, art two, art three, art four. And I'm like, well, how can you really do like a comprehensive program if you're not teaching like a full semester of ceramics or a full semester of drawing? It's really hard to fit all that in. So this was a very gradual process. So like I started like the first year I was like, I told my administrator, I was like, I'd like to remove um, art two and I'd like to do drawing and painting. And then each year I, I just would write the course descriptions and send it to him. And we've built the program up over the years. So it, it's it's been a journey, let me tell you. So from our personal point of view, from my school, we spent a lot of time writing what we wanted each of these paths, like what we wanted these students to learn. And so they understood too, when they signed up for these classes, kind of the, the pathway it could take them on, it could lead them to. So the required scope, and like I said, this was a lot like um, making students art lovers and kids that might not be really, really good at art, but they appreciate it or they like it or kids that hate it, but have to take it. And we tried to make these, you know, these exciting, fun classes for them to maybe like learn like, hey, you don't have to be, you know, fantastic to do this stuff. It, it can be more about process. So we talk a lot about process in our classes and how process is really significant and, um, you know, having to like verbalize things for the kids. So that's something that is very near and dear to my heart because I think sometimes when I get students as freshmen, they seem very intimidated to draw or to paint. They're like, well, I can't do that. I'm like, well, why, who told you you couldn't do that? Like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be beautiful. So it can be whatever you want to express. So the requirement scope, we take that approach. It's more making them comfortable to create and making them appreciate what they're looking at and, and how to communicate with one another about their creative process. So that's really what the requirement scope is all about. The advanced art scope, obviously you're pulling in your college and high school classes, your AP courses. And I would suggest anybody, if you want an AP curriculum at your school, go get the training and do it because you can do it. Um, I did, I started with art history because my background was initially in art history. And then I went and got the studio uh, training as well. And, you know, the first two years are challenging, but then, you know, it's such a rewarding um, program and it really takes the, the caliber of the arts program to the next level. You're able to do, um, you know, you're able to get there without these AP courses and without college and high school courses. I just think that when they see that there's like, like this is a college level class, like you have to take it seriously, it's going to be regimented and it's going to be fast paced. 
that they know that these building blocks to get there, that they're gonna have to take things seriously. And then our technical skip, I think it's really important to offer the technical arts just because of our ever growing world. So um, we wanna make these students proficient in the Adobe programs and proficient on how to look at design because design is very different from obviously um, a lot of the studio arts. And I think that if you teach it differently, like the kids will start to see like where the merge is at. But when we're living in this ever-changing technological society, I think it's really important to teach the kids that like you are living in a visual world. Like it's really important that you're able to translate these things. And I don't think that young people understand like how many different fields there are that you can go into. So I think it's really necessary to make sure that you expose them to as many things possible. And this can look, you know, different for every program. Um, but this is what worked for us because I tried to use the skills of the people that we had in our building um, and put them to use. So we've got um, like one of the, uh, he does CAD. I don't really know what his technical um, title is, but he teaches some of the graphics. And um, I teach digital photography, but I have a background in photography too. So, you know, try to, you got to use your resources, right? So the question then leads to, so we've got our scope and sequence. We've got this together. So this took me about, like I said, two years to do. And every year I was adding new classes. Um, so it took me two years to write scope and sequence. And we just now, I just actually um, wrote for one new class next year. So I'm still, we're still adding courses. But the next question I think it's important to ask is how you make art academic. Um, I think this is really important because I think that once again, you have this mentality with a lot of students that it's blow off class, they take it for an easy A. Um, and then when you have those, that mentality, it's very contagious. And then kids just don't seem to take things seriously. So um, I think that if you set a precedent, like as you as a teacher, because that was my goal when I first came into the teaching profession, that I didn't want kids to think that they could walk all over me. Um, I think that it catches on and then kids take it seriously, but then they get a lot out of it, even though sometimes they don't necessarily like me. Um, so I think starting an NAHS and a National Junior Arts Honor Society is the best way to start this whole idea of making your students involved in their community. Because with this organization comes a requirement of service skill, or um, I'm sorry, service hours. So you've already got the hook. <laughs> so you've got that academic and you've got the service. And then it's just filling in the pieces. How do you make this exciting for kids? How do you make kids feel passionately about this? And this is all in how you run your program and how you approach it. Because if you're excited about it and you, you know, demonstrate by through leadership, then they're going to follow. So I think an induction ceremony is really nice. I think the more you can, you know, put the feathers on it and make it fancy, the better you are. And every year I, I've built every year, like the first year, it was just punch and cookies, you know, and then the second year we had something more formal and then I, and then I got um, officers. So like every year I've been building this year, we started a, um, a scholarship fund. So I have a scholarship chair who's been running fundraisers. And we, you know, we got, I think I've got a picture here. I got a banner this year. So like the more that you can do to make it look serious and, you know, make the kids take it seriously. And it, they get a lot of, they take a lot of pride in this. My students really do. And, you know, they get cords for graduation and, you know, it, but, the, you know, their hard work pays off. So it's not just something where it's like, here, you filled out an application and now here's a cord. It's like you had to do something over the past four years to accomplish this. And I have very strict guidelines for being a member of NAHS. And if anybody ever wants to see them at the end, I have my email, you can email me and I'd be happy to send you any information that I could potentially give you. So here's my students this year. So we were actually able to do an in-person uh, ceremony. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was really important to me to give them that opportunity for them to be recognized. And, and I think that's really important as well. And I think that's why it's important to run such a, a, an academic program because I think when you display their art and you make them take ownership in it, they're gonna take things more seriously. I think it's really important to make the uh, 
this idea of academics, I submit to every publication I can possibly get my hands on. I have an ongoing list, which I can send anyone. Um, and every, you know, we're in publications probably once or twice a year. Like I said, this is something that I build on. Like one year I'll start, I'll do one and then I'll add it to my list and I'll do two. I have a book that I keep by my desk that I have all these things in that I try to go month by month when I'm gonna do this, how I'm going to do it. So it, it does take some organization on your end, but we're teachers so we can do 500 things at once. It's what we do. I think it's important that you show, you show your student work. So I always look for new exhibitions to put my students work in because I think it's just another way for them to A, get their name out in the community B, it's networking, and C, like they're taking it seriously. Like they don't want to put crap out there. Like they're going to take ownership in this. And you know, every year, like, and I tell them, I'm like, hey, I can only send three pieces or I can only send two. Like, you know, you got to submit. So, and, um, you know, they get really excited about it. One year I had students uh, both exhibit at the Andy Warhol exhibition at their youth invasion. So that's one that, you know, that was a big deal because that was at a museum. So the kids were like really excited about that. So every year they're like, are we going to apply to the Warhol? I'm like, heck yeah, you're going to apply. So they get really excited. Um, I think it builds this really good energy in the art room. Um, I always like with my AP courses, I talked a little about, about that. I would reach out to your local colleges. I reached out to three of our local colleges and I'm running four classes through their college. So kids can pay and get college and high school credit. And this was all through me buddying up to our guidance counselor and like seeking this out for myself. And, you know, a lot of colleges are really open to this because then it opens doors for them as well to, you know, potentially pull kids in. And the nice thing is, is most of these credits that these kids are getting go to almost any school. The only ones they don't is like Ivy League or borderline Ivy League. So it's a lot like AP classes. I work with other teachers. We have a strong STEM program at our school. So I'm always making sure I work with math teachers and science teachers, especially because those are two subjects that kids don't think can tie, but they tie so much. I have an amazing chemistry teacher who does an entire lesson on color mixing and the chemical compounds of color. Um, I still do not understand it, but I'm happy to go and like participate and be an active participant. This piece here, this was um, my AP art history class. We worked with the math teacher on scaling a church plan down to scale properly. Um, and they had to do it with masking tape and then uh, write all the vocabulary in it. It, it was very stressful for me because it was a lot of measuring and converting. I have students design the uh, graduation book each year too. So they have to put their name in each year. Uh, seniors will have the opportunity to do this. I have the, all publications that go out from our school are designed by our students. So that's just yet another way that you can infiltrate like your program into the entire school. And I think that any opportunity that you can get, um, you can do that. And your art teachers, so like you're extremely creative to begin with. So I come up with the craziest ideas and execute them as best as I can. And this is an example of one of them. <laughs> so I do what's called the Festival of Living Pictures every year. We started about seven years ago and I, we were a Catholic school. So I tied into Lent, but my art history and my AP studio students reenact famous paintings that go along with the seven or the Stations of the Cross and the music departments involved and the literature departments involved. And it's just awesome and the kids get excited about it every year. You know, they wanna take these classes because they wanna be an active participant in all these things. Um, and we invite like local communities in to, to watch the program as well. It's really, really exciting. We built this frame with the tech department. Um, they, it's like a 10 by 10 foot freestanding frame that the kids stand in. It's just really cool. And here's some other pictures of it. So the kids pick the artwork that they're going to recreate. I let I and that's something else I probably should have said. All of these programs, like I work with my students, but I make them execute it I, because I'm like I don't have time. I teach seven classes. Like you have to, if you want to do this, you have to do it. 
And I think by, you know, guiding them and being a mentor is the best way to make them leaders because, you know, they have to take things and they have to take it seriously because they're putting their name on it, not me. So I think that's another, you know, good example of how you make things academic too, because this is, you know, all, all school wide. I make my kids present a lot. Um, I think it's a really good thing for them to understand how to talk. And especially if you're going to be putting them out into the community, they need to learn how to present ideas and communicate ideas with other people. Um, I host lunch and breakfast critiques and open studios during my lunch. Now, I only do this once a month because I know that you're giving up time. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, I completely understand. But I think it's a really good way to, um, you know, encourage your students to be in the studio more, um, encourage them to like learn new things, things that they might not have been able to explore in the classroom itself, but you know that they wanted to learn themselves so we do that we have so i'll get breakfast for them and like they'll have breakfast critiques and then they'll do open studios as well and i work closely with our other art teacher on all this schedule gallery visits i go to the local um local galleries in my community we do live close to pittsburgh so that's nice but this particular picture here is from one of the college exhibitions that is like five minutes down the road I host European travel. That was something I, I took on about five years into my career. So that, and it's all um, art based. So that's some, another thing, but they have to be art students because, you know, we do the whole tour is based on art and architecture. You know, that's something like you can put in the back of your mind if it's something that you'd be interested in doing, but it's just another way that I've built the program and um, built it academically too. We go to New York every year um, and you know, they have to earn this. This is once again, my AP classes and my advanced classes. So they have to take these, these building blocks to get to these points. This was in New York. Um, we host, I've worked really, started working on grants and getting um, artists and residents to come in. And this is like how creative I had to get this year that we had a Zoom artist in residence. And it was really cool and I think it's, um, amazing and really necessary for kids to hear somebody other than me. Because I think that when they're getting multiple people driving home like the same ideas, um, it starts to stick. So if they're only hearing me talk about how much I love art, like I don't know how much it's translating in their minds. <laughs> okay, so if you want your students to be community leaders, they have to be community leaders in your school first because they, they have to learn there. They have to learn in their comfort zone before you like shove them out the nest as you would a bird. So we run task parties and we do mentoring programs inside the school. Because we're attached to the junior high, we've done mentoring programs with ceramics. We've done like throwing on the wheel. We've done mentoring programs with mural painting um, we've done these lunch studios, these open studios where seniors will take uh, freshmen. And we'll, uh, we try to identify students that may need like a mentor, like somebody that really, like maybe they're having a hard time at lunch, like an underclassman because their friends are not being nice. And we try to like pull them into this. So this is one way that, you know, my, my students are able to, to work as leaders and almost like art therapy. So we talk a lot about that too. We talk a lot about like, exploring our ideas through our art and, you know, teaching other kids that it's okay. Like sometimes you just need to go to the studio and draw and you'll feel a lot better. The task party is probably one of my favorite things that we do. I don't know if you're familiar with task. Um, it's an artist by the name of Oliver Herring. He's from New York City. He did this task party. So it's this idea where they've got all these tasks in a box. And I think he did one in Central Park. And these people just come in and they pull these tasks and they have to complete them. But you work with other people and it's like, um, it builds these social skills and like you have to work with people that you've never you know, met before, never seen before. And then you have to keep pulling tasks and then you have to write another task for other people. So our, our older kids, like our juniors and seniors will do this with uh, the junior high. And then we did a school-wide one last year too, which was, so much fun. And it was on one of our um, 
you know how you have like the fun days or whatever where they're like doing spirit stuff well i always make sure i nose my way into it because like we always we always cheer for the athletes and i'm i'm right there like i'll wave my flag but i think that they have to cheer for the arts too so i always make myself i'm a little pushy with my administrator sometimes i think i drive crazy <laughs> This is another example where kids are just infiltrating into the school and they're making their art seen. And these are underclassmen and they were inspired by a project that the uh, upperclassmen were doing. And I was like, well, go hang it with the rest of them. So I always make sure that I display all my students' artwork. And um, I think it just, it just excites everybody and the kids wanna do it. So I think it's a balancing act to do the, you know, the art programs in the school. So every year, my, my upperclassmen run an arts week. Uh, we do dress down days because we wear uniforms. Um, in the one year we did, and we always do some type of drive. So the one year we did a clothing drive and a backpack drive that we donated to the Children's Bureau. I have found a couple of point people at our local Children's Bureau that I've worked very closely with. Um, the one year we donated, we made ceramic baskets and filled them with art supplies for foster kids um, for Christmas. Uh, we've done face painting and I don't have any pictures of this because I'm not allowed to take pictures obviously, but we did face painting at the adoption day. We do it every year, they always call me. They have a foster day picnic that we send kids and they do face painting. And like, I think it, it's more impactful for my students than it actually is like those kids. I mean, they're excited and they think it's great, but my, it's very humbling for my students to be a part of these things. So we run this arts week. Um, I always try to do themes because I, I think it's really important to work in themes. So, you know, I, but I always try to make sure I'm pulling in all the arts. So that's something else that we do to involve the whole school. And my students are always the ones that um, get out in the community and the, our, our school community and make sure that like these ideas are getting out there and that they're involving their classmates, especially when you know there's a lot of kids that can't necessarily take um, art classes because they can't fit it into their schedule. And I think that happens a lot. So I think this it's just another reason that um, this is really important to do. Now, this is where I think the bridge is at. I think that I started really reaching out locally in the, to the community when I hosted our first alumni art show because like it got people in and it got these alumni who still practice art, whether they're like professional artists or it's just something that they do in their spare time. I think that they kids were able to talk to these people and like, you know, get ideas and listen to like the things that they do. So this is something that we do every two years. I can't do it every year because it, it is a huge undertaking to like take on all this alumni art. But I think that this was the pivotal point in my program where I'm like, oh, we can like go out into the community and we can, you know, do these things. So here's another picture of like our opening. And we just did it in the gym. Like I you got to adapt to what you have and we don't have an auditorium so this is what we did so i have a video i'm going to play for you and i want to make sure that i shared and this is a former student of mine she's going to talk very briefly about um her experience and working in the community as a leader and as an artist Hi, my name is Delaney Zeckley, and I'm a graduate of the class of 2019 at Greensburg Central Catholic, and I am currently an art history, art repatriation, and social change major at John Carroll University. Um, I would like to start off by saying that I received such an amazing art education at Greensburg Central Catholic, and I would not be where I am today without the hard work and dedication that Mrs. T and Miss Morgan put into the art education. Um, department there. So I think one of the greatest lessons that I learned in the art room was how to use art to engage with the global community. Um, being an art historian, I really am interested in just how you can engage with art to understand what people were going through when they created the art that they were making. And I'm a little partial, but I think art is a wonderful way to engage with the world. 
around you because you can understand through visualization just what other people were seeing and thinking at this time. So it makes you more um, aware of the world that's around you. And I think that's something that was really important and really emphasized in my art education. But not only did Mrs. T emphasize how to engage with the global community, but also how to engage with your local community. Um, my senior year, I was lucky enough to help Mrs. T with a task party. And for those of you that don't know what a task party is, it's like a little, um, day where you get together and there's hundreds of tasks in a little bin and they're all somehow connected to art and you need other people's help to accomplish these tasks and it really teaches you how to work together in artistic ways and I think that was something that was so special because it really showed me and emphasized to me and my classmates that art isn't something that's contained to a classroom or a museum or a set space. Art is, art is all around us. It's in the world around us. And it brings us together. Um, and seeing that firsthand in high school showed me just how much it applies outside of high school or just the classrooms that I was in. It applied to the real world around me. And I carried this service with me into college um, and I'm still engaging in communities to see um, just the impact of art in various forms upon different groups of people. So I think the greatest thing that I learned from my art education was not only does art impact you in a global way, but it also impacts you in a local um, personal way. And I think that was the best thing that I could have ever asked for from Mrs. T. So I thank her so much for that. So that was very touching, but <laughs> um, a lot of my students always come back and tell me like how, how they appreciated so much that like I kind of pushed them and was like, go do this, go, go express yourself, go help other people in your community, you know, be active in the arts. So, um, Hi. So that leads me to my last two um, key points. So I went through my first three. So I think networking in your community is probably the most important thing you can do if you want to eventually have your students go out and act as leaders and have service through the arts. So I work with, we have a local theater. Who, it's a community theater. They do a lot of outreach programs. Um, you know, they're nonprofits, so I suggest always looking at your nonprofits, see if they need help. Anything with the Children's Bureau, they have been like such so accepting and like just they can't thank us enough and they just want our kids to be there all the time. Um, local elementary schools, we've done a lot of mentoring in local elementary schools um but this was and we had we started painting this right before covid hit so i'm hoping once things open a little bit back up we can do it. but so my students designed uh this mural for the local theater and they're painting it i mean i'm helping them along the way but they're painting it now i realize that this takes dedication on you know your end as well so it has to be something that you're willing to do but it can be so rewarding. So this is a um, mural that my students painted in a local preschool. They went in when the kids weren't there, like they drew it out, they designed it, they went in and painted it. Um, they've gone into elementary schools and mentored with like, you know, fifth and fourth graders and taught them how to do things. Uh, just this week, because of COVID, um, they reached out to the elementary schools and they did a Zoom lesson with an elementary school, step-by-step uh, -step art projects. Um, you know, the mentoring is probably the best way you can like infiltrate into the community. But I think that the face painting, you know, anytime you can offer your services, like they always do the autism walk, they, I send kids there and they face paint. Um, and they, they've done other things too. They've done finger painting with them and, and craft making and whatever you can come up with. It doesn't have to be this masterpiece, but just to get them out and working with other people, I, I think is just 
it's just a wonderful and exciting thing to watch your kids blossom like that. It's one thing to watch them blossom in the classroom. It's another thing to see them do it out in their uh, society or in their community. And lastly, I think it's really important that if you preach it, you better do it. So um, I, <laughs> I decided that I really wanted to be more active in my community. So I, um, I joined the board at the local theater um, and I do, I've been doing about three or four public lectures a year um, for anybody that wants to come and listen. I think that art history and some types of studios are not something that people have easily accessible to them, especially in certain communities. And I don't, I don't think it should be education for the elite. I think that it should be education for anybody that wants to learn it. So we did this, um, we've been running an outreach program through the theater for uh, like all, any kid in the area that wanted to show. So we've been running like art shows along with the performances that they've been doing. Some were for adults, some were for kids. Um, we started doing, my kids are coming in and teaching like painting classes. And, uh, you know, we talked about three dimensional, but once again, like we've been in this holding pattern. So we've been trying to come with that, with ideas. Um, those are just a few things that I've done. Um, I always go and support all these local walks, like the autism walk and I do, you know, Relay for Life and anything that I can go and, you know, be a support and, you know, make signs, you know, people love that too when, when kids show up with, with signs. So here's one of the lectures that I did last year. Um, you know, just trying to engage, you know, and my students always come to these lectures. They, they think it's uh, great. And there's my email <laughs> and there's my website. If there's anything that I said that was of interest and, in, you know, you'd like to talk more about with me or you want me to send you some information, I'd, I'd be happy to do so. I did not get to this point in my career without a lot of help from a lot of people and asking a lot of questions and I still have so much to learn. So I'm just so happy to be able to share some of this stuff with you because it's been, um, there's been a lot of tears involved in this, this climb in, <laughs> so thank you for listening. <laughs> Wow, that was a lot of great information. So if anybody has questions for Erin, you may either type them in the chat role for her or you may unmute and ask them live. It is your choice to decide how you want to present your questions. And while you were talking about the task party, I did put a link in there to um, Oliver Herring's um, task party website, just in case people were unfamiliar with that. So I did put that in the chat. He's awesome. I reached out to him and he told me anytime I wanted to bring students to his studio, he'd be happy to host us. I heard that he's that he likes that and, and loves, you know, the interaction with art teachers and students. So that's fantastic. Oh, it looks like there's a question in there for you. So I think that, you know, um, you can take this and maybe like water it down a little bit, just like we do with like the things that we teach. So I would say make those middle school kids, the mentors to the elementary school kids, because I think, because I work with middle schoolers a little bit. And I think that they take so much pride when you teach, when you treat them like adults, you know, and give them like this um, idea that they have a responsibility. So um that's what I would suggest. And I mean, you can even host, you know, some of these outs, outs, outside of school things with middle school kids too. There's no reason that you couldn't because they're completely capable. And sometimes they're more receptive than the high school kids. <laughs> Oh, I'm first year teacher at a really small school. Um, 
Um, <clears throat> so I think that, I mean, you, you can, you know, obviously Google and look at like what these big schools are doing because they're out there for everybody to look at. And I, I did that, but it wasn't a reality for me. So like I said, I had to, I started with classes that I felt very comfortable with teaching. So my background is in art history and painting and drawing. So I started with that because, you know, teaching three dimension to me was like very intimidating. And um, some of these other classes that, that we taught. So after I started building and would get really comfortable in those classes, um, I started taking courses over the summer. So like I could build myself into a position that I felt comfortable teaching it. But I think you're, I mean, it is very stressful when you're starting out. I mean, as is any, you know, starting anything. Um, and it's scary because, you know, I, trust me, there have been so many times where I've done things and I'm like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so then you got to start over again, but don't ever let it like stop you from, you know, going, moving forward. But I think that's great that you're starting that list and stuff. And, you know, stay on the administrators because they, uh, sometimes that, you know, you'll get pushed back because it, it's hard for them to, to push those new classes and stuff. Yeah, it does take time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you gave everybody so much to think about. It's still all swirling around in our heads. <laughs> I know. I felt like I talked a lot. <laughs> it, it is. It's a very impressive program. And for those out there that are newer teachers, keep in mind it, 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 it takes time. It, you know, a program like this that Erin has built doesn't happen overnight. She's worked very hard little by little every year adding things. So it does take time, but it, but it's, it's obvious through her example, it's possible. And you do have, she's correct. You do have to stay on your administrators and, and keep showing them how your program is, is not just fun. It's, it's academically sound, you know, show them the research, show them how it affects the brain, show them how good those creative thinking and problem solving skills are great for no matter what career path that um, your students choose. So I actually really loved in the beginning how, um, you know, she broke her program down into those separate paths to show that to her administrators that she's taking that into consideration. And that kind of shows the academic thought behind it. So I think that's fantastic. So I, I we do just, we just started a NJAHS. Um, I'm not the teacher that runs it. The other teacher is because I don't teach junior high but she does amazing things with them. She, um, you know, she's doing those lunch studios with them and, you know, they do, they're doing mural paintings at the school and, and she just started. So, and she's, you know, I, I'm a senior teacher to her. So she's just learning and getting her feet wet with some of this stuff too. And they do a great publication. I think every quarter, um, the National Arts Honor Society and I would always suggest, you know, submitting stuff to them and looking and seeing what other teachers are doing because you get great ideas from other teachers. Anybody else have anything for Aaron? I always hate to rush because I never want people to feel like they have to pen it quick while they type to get their, you know, their question out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Um, something else that I've taken a lot of uh, opportunity with is um, professional development too, which, you know, there's so many grants out there for teachers. So I, I mean, I, I got the opportunity to go to New York and study at the Guggenheim and the Met and the Museum of Modern Art. And I was at the National Gallery one year. So, you know, I think that too, like, you know, build your confidence and like how to execute things in your school as well. So, you know, you got to treat yourself too. <laughs> Work so hard as teachers. <laughs> 
yeah, thank you for listening. Yep, and then don't forget that her um, email and her website are on the screen. Um, so you can certainly take note of that to contact her if you know you realize you have any other questions, you know, in a, in a day from now or a few days from now, definitely get in contact with her. Um, yes, yeah, so this was absolutely fantastic. So thank you, Erin, again, for such great information. Thank um, you. We do hope that everybody really enjoyed um, your time with us tonight. Please make sure that you have signed in in the chat roll to verify your, partici your participation in tonight's webinar. And remember, the registration links for all other PAEA-sponsored events are also available on the PAEA website calendar, the PAEA Facebook pages, and of course, through emails and newsletters coming out from your division or region reps. So keep in mind to check your email for the Act 48 link coming soon. And unless anybody has any other questions, and I'm not seeing anything else pop up, I'm just going to wait another second or two if anybody's still typing. But I guess that's a wrap then. So again, Aaron, thank you very much for all that lovely information. And good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>